Okay, and welcome back, everybody. It is uh, it is June. It is uh, a couple days after Michigan has pretty much opened up. Camp Talk Live is gearing up for the rest of the season. Hopefully, we can start doing things. We had a uh, we had these delays last year when we tried to go camping. We had some some you know family issues going on. We weren't able to get out this year. The Rona, but uh, we're live. We're back. We're here. We're we're joined with uh, my dearest friend Tom Kinney and oh, as always, executive producer Andy Smith. How you doing today, boys? Doing good. 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 Doing good. All right. Today we're going to be talking about a plethora of subjects. We're going to be talking about, uh, uh, what do you call it? Dispersed camping? Yep. Dispersed camping. Uh, as you can see, we got the Dutch oven here. That's why Tom is here. Tom has uh, got, what, 15 years uh, Dutch oven cooking? Roughly. Yep. Roughly cooking experience. So um, we're going to get right to the show. Now, first of all, I'd like to thank our Dutch oven community for joining us on the show because we will be sharing it with them. Um, here in a moment. Uh, if you're just joining us, make sure uh, you like the page so you can see more content as it comes out. Also, check out our Instagram, Camp Talk Live on Instagram, to see some of the pictures of some of the Dutch oven stuff that I've posted on there. I'll go through and make sure that everything I have is posted, uh, get some new stuff up there, obviously. Uh, we're not only doing Dutch oven now, but we bought ourselves a Blackstone. So we're going to be doing the flat top cast iron cooking there. So that's... Uh, that's going to be going to be fun moving forward here. But let's dive right into it, Tom. Like I said, you've been doing this for 15 years. Roughly. Um, you, <laughs> roughly. Uh, you've been doing it with the Squires. Those are the young guys, the younglings, if you will, with the Knights of Columbus. Those are them. That's them. So they would go on camping canoe trips. Yes. And then you were in charge of preparing the meals in the Dutch oven. Chief cook, yep. Chief cook. <laughs> 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 and tell us about, you know, okay, so you're... For those of you from the Camp Talk community, there are people that aren't really familiar with how a Dutch oven works. Why don't you explain that real quick? A Dutch oven uh, does what your oven in the house does, but you can just, it's portable. You got it on the handle and you put the coals underneath. You've got the legs to keep it suspended above the coals. You place the coals up on the top and then it puts the heat all the way around to produce the oven effect that you would get in your range in the kitchen nice uh you don't really have to worry about monitoring temperatures with a dutch oven uh, it's you do to depending on what you're cooking and how long it's cooking i mean if you're going to be cooking for something like a pot roast that's going to require a couple hours then you've got to replenish the coals to obviously yeah, yeah. replenish you you that's i mean well i don't want to say common sense some, some people don't have so they just going to put it in there it didn't cook all the way well no it's a three hour cook and your coals were dead in 45 minutes <laughs> so um uh so obviously it's it's easy to cook, easy to clean as well. Yes. Um, some of the some of the myths out there is you do not use detergents. You can, you like can. you said, sparingly. Sparingly, yes. Very. Just, just a few drops, just enough to keep it, create a little suds action there to help clean it up. Yep. There, but. you can use steel wool pad, all that good stuff. As long as you keep it well seasoned, because the seasoning helps pre, uh, keep a nonstick surface on the thing, so it. it makes it easier to clean and easier to cook. Let's talk about the seasoning real quick then, too. Okay, well, uh, it's uh, what you do is, I've, well, it's written down, so let's just open it up. You give it a good coating of oil. You want to use oil, you don't want to use um, lard, because lard will... What's the best type of oil, though? Uh, lard, oil. lard will uh, spoil. It'll, yes, yes. It, 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 nice. Yes. And he's an Eagle Scout, too, so he knows some of this stuff. <laughs> so, yes, you, you, you want to use a vegetable oil or an olive oil. Um, and then to season the, the Dutch oven. Go look at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Not worth starting over. <laughs> okay, that, seasoning the Dutch oven. Okay, coat it with the oil. And then you're going to want to put it in an oven. Okay. Okay. And you want to turn the oven up to 350 degrees. And you're going to um, bake it for at least one hour and then turn the oven off and just let it set in the oven overnight. Take it out in the morning when it's cold. Gotcha. And then it's seasoned. Do you do another coat after that? No. no. Nope. Just uh, a, a good seasoning. Does every that smoke up the house a little bit? Not at all. Not at all? Make, but you will want to make sure you put some foil down at the bottom of your oven because the oil will drip off the pan. Because you turn it upside down. You turn that upside down, yes. Gotcha, gotcha. So, all right, well, we got some of the cool, easy things out of the way is how to take care of it, how to <clears throat> how to set it up for cooking. Let's talk about... Um, go ahead. That 
as far as the seasoning goes, that would also apply to your pie irons, things like that, your griddles. Yes. Anything that's cast iron that you would get. Yeah, I just did that with the Blackstone. Yep. So, and um, you can actually season the stuff. If you don't want to do it in the house, uh, you can do it in your barbecue. I've done that before with my um, my pie irons yeah. because they're sort of a funny shape and they have the wood handle. Yeah, you don't want to put those in an oven, do you? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about some of the dishes you'd prepare for the boys, the prep, the food, you know, because obviously you want to do something that's going to be delicious, hearty, yet still simple. Yeah, I, I uh, what, uh, one of their favorite dishes uh, when they'd come off the river was uh, what we called hunter's pie. The original recipe was called rancher's meat pie, but um, somebody donated some venison, so we renamed it hunter's pie. Uh, it's basically a Tex-Mex version of shepherd's pie, and spicier, and then a cornbread crust on top um, instead Ooh. of the mashed potatoes. And uh, yeah, I would anybody who was left at the campsite, I'd put them to work. Somebody's chopping vegetables. Somebody was helping prepare the meat and get you know. And I'd put everybody to work to put dinner together. And and yeah. then while they were, did you go on the river too? Not while well, <laughs> there wasn't time for cooking and canoeing at the same time. Oh, that's, that's the bummer part. Yeah, it, it is. It is. T it's like, a, you know, bringing the smoker, you know, we've, mine is a smoker that's got to be maintained every 15 minutes. You've got to, you've got to stoke the fire, add the fire to keep that temperature constant in that box. Yep. But, you know, that's part of the fun of, of smoking. Well, you got to do the same thing with this. You got to keep yeah. rotating this every 10 to 15 minutes because you don't want to create hot spots. Right. I do. I do quarter turns every 15 minutes. Every so 15. every hour it's getting four turns. Yep. Uh, that's a turn of the pot and then a, a quarter turn of the pot and a quarter turn of the lid. So I do like counterclockwise and then counterclockwise Exactly on, on the lid. And I've also got the handle, which is out in the camper. So, um, Oh yeah, that's definitely something you want to get is the, the handle for lifting the, yes, the, 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 the one that off, locks the lid lifter. Lo Lodge yep. makes a really good handle. You can get it on Amazon. That's where I got mine. So they're, they're not very expensive. No, no it's got the hook on it that you can grab and, and pull it out of the fire. Cause sometimes you just put it in a fire. You don't even necessarily need coal. They take the coals. Um, I, Carmen in our, in our Dutch oven community, who's probably watching right now, he, he does 90% of his stuff with fire. He doesn't use coals. I've done that. I've got a tripod. Or I should say and, he uses fire and coals. Um, I've I've done pork chop dinners, but the problem is that the carbon builds up on the outside when you use the actual fire in the fire pit. And right. at, that's a bigger pain. To, I mean, putting a little soapy water inside to clean the inside is fine, but all of that black on the outside is a big pain. So I don't, I've kind of stayed away from that because it is a lot more mess. We've, we've always used uh, Carmen. Leave your the, comments. Um, Let me know what you think about uh, the difference between coals and and and, and actual fire. Because you know uh, you see all the westerns where they're they're just it's hanging over the fire with a tripod, you know, and it's that's what they the settlers cooked that way. And they, it didn't, works. they didn't have charcoal back right. then. It, that's what I've oh, always no. used. I've always just used the fire pit, and that's what we always used in the scouts. But. Um, we were always just out in the woods, and we just didn't want to be bringing extra stuff with us. But, but they, that's sort of the way it was. They may not have <laughs> right. had charcoals, but they did break up the the wood to make the coal. The lump coal? The lump coal, too. Right. Yes. Because you could burn that yes. after the fact. So. Yes. So what other good type of meals is are great for a Dutch oven on a summer camping day i mean what are some what are some of your favorites and i'll tell you some of mine uh got quite well like I said, the first thing i did into these things was something called pork chops with uh a potato sauce and i Ooh. don't know why it was called potato sauce but yeah it was pork chops with potatoes and cream of mushroom soup and some seasonings and the guys fell in love with that cooking so quickly that the following year at their banquet they got me a bigger Dutch oven, which you have. I could still, still, I've had that for I think three years now. <laughs> it has been commandeered. It, yes. ca it came out. It came out of the in-laws' camper, and it's been in. It's been in the sunset now for almost two years. Well, actually, it's in the garage now because we didn't use it then. We used it. Uh, I want to say two years ago, we took it on a camping trip where we made, which is one of my favorites, which is breakfast casserole. Um, 
we do that usually in the oven here at home, but it's, you know, you take your hash browns. We just buy the, the pre-portion from the store, or potato pieces with onions and peppers. It's yep. so much easier. But the fun part, and you know, when you're prepping that meal is you're cooking the sausage in that Dutch oven. So you're, you're really greasing it up. I don't, I don't do much once the sausage comes out. I wipe that grease around inside and, and leave it there. Then the potatoes and onions go down. Yep. Um, it just and makes then, it simple. Oh, with with sausage, bacon, um, God, what else have we used? Cubed ham. We've put cubed ham in there. Extra peppers, you know, extra fresh peppers and onions. Sometimes we do fresh peppers and onions and just the frozen potatoes because it's it's easier yep. to do, you know, as far as prep time goes. If you want something simple, always buy the Ordeal or your Kroger brand or whatever it is, diced potatoes or hash browns. They cook in the egg regardless. So in that dish, it took an entire 18 pack of eggs. <laughs> yeah, that, yes, that one will. Yeah. So, we, but we made it for, I think, five, six people. And then we, we did it last year. And then we still had enough to feed to the next day. Yeah, several yeah. people the next day. Yeah, and, that, and that's the beauty of it. You cook it on Saturday and on Sunday, you just heat it up. And, and if you've got a camper, you heat it up in your microwave. If, if, you, if you're campfire based you pull it out of your cooler put it back in your dutch oven and throw it over a fire you know 20 minutes is probably hot, you know going to be warm enough put a little excuse me a little water in there to give it a good steam and a perfect way to heat it back up but that's the beauty part because you know especially with these dinners is the next day they're they're great for or even later that that evening you know if you're out late drinking and you want something or grab, you're grab out, that shot, that, out on the trail out out doing activities whatever you're you just want something simple. <laughs> you I think, you I yourself think the out, surprise breakfast whatever. I did one time called for sliced hot dogs and uh, instant mashed potatoes, and I thought, what the heck? But <laughs> it was good. Hot dogs surprisingly complement eggs quite nicely. <laughs> eggs, yes, and mashed mm. potatoes, and mashed potatoes, yes, in the Dutch oven, in the Dutch oven, yes. Huh. I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to look into that. So, uh, tell us about some of the fabulous desserts you made. You you desserts. came to an event. Um, that's where I learned about Dutch ovens. You came to an event that uh, we were doing some cooking for, and you offered to do dessert. Well, you were you were phenomenal. That re- you know, just as a as a great friend and and a, you know and help. It was a great weekend to have you there, but <laughs> it was a nightmare, wasn't it? Uh, Storming. It was. No, uh, I've had worse. There was a lot of rain that, yes, there was a lot of rain. <laughs> that night, that night, I was up at 4 a.m. to get the smoker going. I cooked uh, eight pork shoulders and 15 racks of ribs. Tom did three Dutch ovens full of apple crisp. Yeah. And it was uh, it was a phenomenal night. So I want to say thank you again because to that day, I mean, that's when I got introduced to the Dutch oven pie. But tell, other than apple, well, go ahead and tell about the apple crisp. Uh, yeah, the apple crisp. But well, that's right out of this book right here. Um, yeah, the apples and the crumble with the oatmeal and and uh, the seasonings and and oh yeah, that one's a good one. Uh, my grandmother's oatmeal cake. Um, Tell me about the oatmeal cake. Oh, oh gra- my grandmother used to bring that to all of our, all of the family gatherings. That was her signature dish, and right. it's got, it's a very moist cake, uh, kind of like a spice cake, and it's got this uh, um, cooked frosting that goes over it. That's brown sugar and uh, evaporated milk and butter. That's the only three ingredients. Oh know. wow! <laughs> and and uh, it's oatmeal evaporated. No, no, the the frosting was the. Oh, okay. The oatmeal's in the cake itself. It's basically a spice cake, but you know, they loved that and um, uh, pineapple upside down cake. Uh, yeah, you told me about that. Bread pudding. Yeah, the, you can bake a loaf of bread in that thing, can't you? You can. Yeah. In fact, currently I've been making since the quarantine, and I've been making. Uh, uh, my sourdough bread in the Dutch oven. At home. Oh, really? Yes. You doing it in the oven though? In the in oven. the Dutch oven. Yeah, in the Dutch oven in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Well, <laughs> well, it it works. Well, the thing is, with, with what I've got one without the legs, and so what you uh, the idea is the iron helps uh, give that extra crispy crunch to the crust, ah, and okay. you bake it with the lid for the first half of baking it because the steam helps give the top crust that extra crunch too, and then you take it off for the last half for so it'll brown. Ah, very nice. Um, what is the hardest thing you've ever cooked in a Dutch oven? Uh. 
well, probably the pineapple upside down cake, just because these things are so heavy and you're trying to turn that cake out onto a pan. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Especially the big one. Well, the, the oatmeal cake got turned out, too. But That's probably a 25 or 30 pound uh, yeah, yeah, they're I not. Yeah, what, they're not light. They're no. not light, and no. the big one is even. It's probably double because it's double that size, so it's, it's well even heavier. The only dessert I've ever made in that was the apple crisp that you requested, and that didn't have to get turned out. You just spooned that out of the. And that 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 was a that was a huge huge uh, success yes. with with the the people that we fed that weekend. Um, Andy, what are some of the things you've cooked in them as a Eagle Scout? Oh, we've done. The apple crisps, the peach cobbler, stuff like that for desserts, that's always a, a big, big hit. Um, uh, dinners, we've done stew, stuff like that, uh, beef stew, that that's usually pretty popular. Um, for breakfast, uh, we actually were doing things like the, uh, the breakfast castle, or like we we're doing now. That's, you know, the breakfast casserole it's, when we're it's camping. Just, it's simple, but it fills you up. It you know what I like doing with it now? It keeps you going the whole day. During the quarantine when I was doing the team truck, we were doing it in, you know, a corning glass in the corningware in, in the oven. And it was it was coming out about yay thick, right? If you look on Instagram, everybody, you'll see the camp. It was that thick. Remember how thick that sucker was? Yep. We had bacon, sausage, um, ham, Green, fresh green peppers, green onions, and it was what uh, almost three pounds of of shredded potatoes in there. But it was that thick. But for the for the yep. what I was doing for in the team truck, a little bit, you know, thick this thick, you know, um, just so it cook a little quicker. <laughs> oh, cook a little quicker, and who needs that much when you're, you know, I'm. What I did is I cut them into squares. And made breakfast sandwich. So you know we had we had some pretty nice luxuries in that truck. So I had a toaster oven that was actual toaster and toaster oven. You put the toast in the top, and the oven was on the bottom. And it's only a unit about yay wide, yay tall. It, it worked out great. So I would toast the bread with you know a little ketchup on top, and you know it's a nice breakfast sandwich. So also great, you know, if you're if you're there for a couple of days, you know, especially you know camp, like a morning canoe trip. We usually like to go after the crazies are off the river on a weekend. We'll, you know, we'll arrive to the livery on, on Sunday and, and go on Monday. So for a quick breakfast, it was cooked on, you know, Sunday. You know, you could be doing Dutch oven breakfast in there for tomorrow morning, you know, while you're doing dinner prep. So it's you, depending on how many ovens you got. Carmen, I know you he's he'll have six or seven, of them, maybe even eight stacked in one pile. Wow. He's a monster. I've, when you get I've a chance, never seen that. The I, I, Dutch I, I, oven community on Facebook is huge. We have over fifty six or fifty seven thousand members, and it is really, really cool as far as the stuff that you know. There's a lot of obviously people come in. There's a lot of questions. Carmen's got a lot of, uh, and I hope you're feeling well. By the way, buddy, it's been a while since we talked. Last I heard, he wasn't feeling so hot. So, um, the. Uh, yeah, the the amount of I mean, this guy does it for all time. You know, like literally, he puts parties together where people go camping. And when I mean camping, this guy's setting up uh, an A-frame tent with canvas and sleeping on the ground. And then he's got you know the old uh, the old cowboy pajamas. You know, he's he he takes it very very you know literal, and it's and it's awesome. You know that old school. You know, out there out west. You know, like the the I don't want to say the pilgrim the. <laughs> The, uh, the old ways of doing it. Yeah, and and I mean, literally, he'll cook. He, I forget. I, you can go through the page and look. He's got, you know, probably twenty or more. Dutch that sort ovens. of reminds me of uh, of be, well, of when I was in Scouts, where it was you would get up in the morning and you were cooking for thirty, forty people, and yeah, you're cooking for an hour, two what hours. What we used to have was we called it the Paul Bunyan skillet. Oh. It was literally a skillet that was this big around, made out of aluminum. Because if it wasn't aluminum, you couldn't move it. Right. And we would cook 36 or 48 eggs at a time. <laughs> oh, nice. And we would just crack them all and dump them all in there and cook them all up I at once. I used to, when I had the big one out cooking dinner, and there, last time I had it, there was about a dozen boys from other campsites who came to join us for dinner. <laughs> oh yeah, because you're, you're making you're making so much food. But uh, yeah, Carmen's got like I said, he's got a lot of Dutch ovens, and when he, when he does these programs where they get together and they cook, 
he cooks a ton of food and it's he's got he's got a system down that's you know second to none obviously he's been doing this a, m a lot longer than we have um, so we're just barely scratching the surface on our knowledge of Dutch oven cooking. We're giving it to you basic. So I think we uh, should have had that, Carmen on the yeah, show. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we need to have a, I, a guest we'll, next time. Him and I <laughs> will probably, you know, Tom was here. Tom is also, you know, going to talk about the camping segment we're going to be talking about, too, because he's got some some input on that as well. So it works out when we get into uh the trails and stuff up north. So um, but after that, you know, so some of the dishes that we've cooked. Um, as far as our group is obviously the apple crisp. You and I have done uh, the breakfast casserole. I did the meatloaf. I've done the pizzas. Uh, I don't know if I took a picture of the meatloaf. I'm sure I did. I I'm pretty sure well, the I meatloaf. Think everyone's done, well, just about everyone, it seems like, has done pie iron pizzas. Pie, or pie iron pizzas. Okay, stuff so like here's, what, here's what you do you bring your or, own crust, or and, grilled cheese and the pie irons. That deep dish, that deep dish pizza that I did. Check it out on Camp Talk Live on Instagram. What did you use for a crust? Sarah brought a, you know, just a rolled dough from home. And then I, what I did was I spread, you know, oiled the side of the pan. Was it uh, just a pre-made dough or did she make her own dough? Homemade dough, dough yeah. Okay. Yeah, she makes homemade dough. You can e e use either or. So, you know, I went for the deep dish. So, I mean, mine was a pizza pizza. I mean, it was... It was pepperoni, sausage, ground beef, ham, bacon, um, pepperoncinis, obviously, sauce and cheese. Um, that's what you got to be careful when you're doing that deep dish. A lot of people put a lot of sauce on the bottom of a, of a, of a deep dish, you know, a Chicago style. That's what makes it really runny. So you got to be careful because you're going to want to pre-cook. Obviously, you pre-cook all your meats because you're going to want to keep that pizza in there for about 35 to 40 minutes. But you got to watch it like a hawk. So your quarter turns are very important on that deep dish. And the light sauce on the bottom, very, very light. I mean light. Because you're going to put that thick sauce on the top. But if you put it thick on the bottom because you like sauce and you're not aware, it'll get make your bottom very runny. Like I said, even though I cut mine open, you know, after it was done, it was still runny. But a lot of that was, you know, when you're making that much meat. You're going to get grease, a lot of more grease. Well, it's not just the grease. The more toppings you put on it, the less your dough is going to cook properly. That too. So it was it was no recipe, no experience, just pure determination. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we're going to pure determination and attention because, like I said, um, I don't think I peeled the crust away at all from the side until it was done. I used the spatula to, to go around it to get... Now, getting a deep dish out of a Dutch oven is also... It's like you're upside down. It is very, very difficult. Especially... Excuse me. Especially the, the deep crust. Now, the thin crust that we did in the other one slid right out. Came, you know, turn out... Get the, the spatula underneath and it came right out because it was a thin crust. So that one... That was like not even 10 minutes in the in the... But again, gotcha. you're going back to the toppings. You, your toppings wouldn't be as heavy on a thin crust. That's why right. cook and they're just it's the, for the wife and kids. Right. It's just double pep, so <laughs> they're just cheese and pep. So it's, and so, yeah, I generally when I make a pizza, try not to go more than three toppings because the dough will not cook properly. The more toppings you put, oh, it, well, considering the dough was thin around the outside, the internal stuff was what I was more worried about. So I only, I only put i think it was only like that much meat and stuff inside and then cheese and then the crust on top so that's you know. still that's pretty thick that's pretty thick yeah uh, but uh, like I'm, i said but for a first attempt if it, yeah, i don't think i've shown you the pictures but oh, when yes, we're done did. oh i did okay yes, did. and you were amazed it turned out that well <laughs> uh, well i was i was impressed yeah but i you know yeah like <laughs> i said I, I still will not go much more than three <laughs> toppings because and uh, yeah a lot of it is it's it's practice. It's it is, it and is. it's you're you're gonna have those instances have where <laughs> make sure you have something for backup, especially if you're not a seasoned <laughs> Dutch oven cooker, because you're gonna burn the shit out of that. The first make, two times I made the oatmeal cake, it did not come out. I, I make sure you at least have, have peanut right. butter and jelly in your box. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, it, 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 the, the third you time will be it glad. Took my third time to get that oatmeal cake right. Yeah. What 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 were what were the things that you did to to get it right? I. Increase the coals humongously to make it hotter. Make it hotter. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah, that's what I've. You know, you, you used to tell me x amount of coals on the top, x amount of coals on the bottom. Now I've come up with my own routine where my circle, the coals are touching. 
you know, but the, you know, they're side to side all the way around the bottom and all the way around the top. So, well, this book here will tell you how many degrees one coal will affect what you're cooking. That's right. that's um, an amazing, you know, that's an amazing. Did actually, you bring yours too? I, <clears throat> yeah, I found this one on our that shelf. Quick. That's just one. I'd of say the, that almost looks like Carmen, <laughs> but <laughs> that's uh, one of the books I found on uh, our bookshelf at home. Uh, Camper's Guide to Outdoor Cooking. We're 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 taking our uh, and um, there's so many different books for Dutch outdoor oven. cooking. YouTube, YouTube videos. App. That's what I watched before I and did my pizza. YouTube. Yep. Those there there's a really good cooking channel. Damn it, I wish I could remember their name right now. These guys do some really cool things, and I watched that video. That's what gave me the beginning knowledge to attempt what I did and how I was able to be successful. I mean, I think I went over on time by like 25 minutes compared to what their time was. That could have been because my heat wasn't right and I, and I didn't think the crust was done. So, um, or it could have been crust. It, it could be, it's, there's so many the different things. Variables, the gotta, type of dough you use compared, they could have just bought store dough. You know, maybe mine was different. Who knows? So it's, it's, um, there's a lot to do, guys. So, you know, check out YouTube, go to your local library, your local bookstore or Amazon and pick up a, a Dutch oven cookbook. And um, uh, we're going to um, we're going to do a lot more with these. You know, my vacation this year, I'm going to be doing some at uh, on our vacation because we're going to stay in one place this year. I'm excited about it. After the Rona, we were supposed to be going to North Carolina. I know in a previous show we were set, said we were going to Kentucky, but then we decided to. Uh, the company has a resort in North Carolina right on the ocean. It's a oh, beautiful, beautiful. F- yeah, beautiful four four star resort, four or five star, whatever. Um, and it's just employees, not open to the public. So it's almost three blocks of beachfront, which is nice. But because of the Rona, we're not really ready to get out and be in public. So we're going to go back up to Brevoort Lake and spend the entire week there. We'll do some stuff around that area. We'll probably go back up and hit the Quamanon and actually spend some time there this time. Last time it was like a quick in and out as we were passing through. We might take the kids to Mackinac if it's not too crazy, but, you know, who knows? So um, let's, uh, let's flip the script here and get into dispersed camping. All right, so we're going to talk about camping again the state's opening up um we're very excited about that obviously here in in, in michigan (laughs) you know we we talked about it in in pre-show it's like why did they close the campgrounds you're like i don't understand it i'm like as much as i hated the idea of closing you know especially the ones local you know but I, i get it you know they didn't the governor didn't want anyone to travel up north at you know out of the metro area hotbed for the rona so i get it but on the other hand you know, it it got to a point where the parks were actually closed. They didn't have staff, so they couldn't open them up. You know, they, like we talked about, you got to go through the preseason opening, getting the pipes turned back on, getting the water flowing, the electrical checks, making sure there's no widow and makers, as you said, hanging from the trees up. So we understood that. But um, the one thing you really wanted to talk about was the dispersed camping, not not necessarily Rona related, but in general. So I'll let you have the floor and, and tell me about why you're a little bit upset about what's been going on with dispersed camping. <laughs> well, camping. Um, as far as the dispersed camping, it's um, dispersed camping is it. It's sort of the complete opposite end of the spectrum from RV camping. Correct. It's more along the lines of what you would do if you were backpacking or. Um, it's a step Car- below rustic camp campgrounds, basically. Right. You're basically you're going out into the woods and just finding an open spot. That's what you're doing. Right. Um, but that's what I've done the majority of my life, pretty much my whole life. And that's what you wanted to do. Right. That's what I was have been wanting to do, and it, it's I don't I haven't wanted to go against the rate against the rules. Right. The the reason that. And we touched on that in in pre-show, too, was the reason I didn't want it was because it's that time of year where we've been cooped up for the winter. It's finally warm enough to take your trailer. Now it's tent. You can take your tent. Exactly. If, if, you're, if you're one of the gung hoes that t- you know that tent camp up in in, in that's <laughs> the way I am. I'm I'm a tent camper. I've I've always been a tent camper until I met you. Now you enjoy the RV life. I've never <laughs> I've never stayed in an RV. Right. And and so um, 
the, but I still love the tent camping. I love the fresh air. I love being. And it's it's what it's good for is your star. mental health. Exactly, the fresh air, just being out in nature. Some people have health health ailments, uh, you know, due to HIPAA law. I can't tell people what's wrong with you. I'm just I mean, kidding. <laughs> basically, it's for me. It's I tell people it's like I can't think. I can't make big decisions when I'm at home. I have to get away from home. I have to get out from time to time. Right. It's, You've been cooped up since. When did we camp last? It's November. No, you didn't. Yeah. Ma- you didn't make that trip. You missed that one. So, yeah. um, no, it was November for me. So December, January, February, March. I got a camper. I'm going camping anywhere now. Right. I mean, it's like it. It finally warmed up. It's like I've been waiting for the weather to break, and then this hit, and it's like you have got to be kidding me. Right. Between <laughs> between working through all of you know working through the winter, all the mental stresses of life, getting out camping is what gives helps, helps you decompress helps you there you go so that's what's been hard for people so we understand yet it was i think it was a little too much you know especially once they relax some of the rules you know as far as people traveling and putting boats in the water that's when they should have you know obviously opened the campgrounds rustic campgrounds uh, michigan state Rustic campgrounds open June 10th. The state parks open June 22nd, which is great because I thought it would be longer. So obviously they took care of eliminating some of that time because they were going to go from the date they released it and then six weeks after for all the opening prep and hiring staff. But apparently they've taken care of that and they're going to be open in two weeks. And so. I give them gr- I give them credit for that because it's a lot of work to get these parks open. Absolutely, they have to go through and check every site, every electrical outlet. Pipes, open, you <laughs> Everything. know. Everything. So it, it needs a staff. And, and that was the part that killed me. I was like, okay, you can still do that social with social distancing. I mean, obviously, if you're doing electrical, you're going to want somebody to watch you know, for safety reasons. But there's still, you know, we, those of us, Tom and I both still work through, through, through the entire thing. So um, being in the park and still, you know, out there cutting and doing things still could have been done. But, you know, like I said, the the biggest thing was the spread of people going from the metro hotbed areas up into northern parts of Michigan that weren't actually where affected. Basically where there wasn't a a larger medical, medical community, community yeah, to, to yeah. support that. But anyway, so we got that part out of the way. Um, we're, we're excited about getting camping again. I think we touched on this at the beginning of the show, but now we're going to talk about, you know, like as we started, as I said, into the dispersed camping, dispersed camping is a step below rustic. It's about as rustic as you can. Right. It's state get. land. There's no porta johns. There's no nothing. Usually you're just going out onto state property, finding a spot under a tree and setting up camp. Yep. It's, so, um, I'm gonna have I'm gonna tag my buddy in this show so because he he actually just asked me about that him and his girl want to go out someplace where they're alone and rustic camp with nobody around them they just yep. want to be out there with them so what is uh, dispersed camping fee right now is there a fee the for fee, dispersed camping There's no fee for dispersed camping Okay uh, the first thing you have to do is you uh, you either have to go to uh, one of DNR's bigger offices. Um, in that uh, area? No, just uh, in the state. Um, so any any local uh, DNR office? You could call the D- DNR office, um, see if they have any of the forms. They Can are, you download those? You can download them. It's uh, PR 4134. It's called the Camp Registration Card. Um, so you still have to register for dispersed camping? Technically, you, you are registering. Uh, what you do, um, it's just a form you fill out. You put it in a Ziploc bag, basically. Tie it to the tree that's at your campsite. It's so when DNR comes by, see somebody occasionally, right? You're not squatting, exactly. <laughs> and what it is, it you basically it's you can camp at the same spot for two weeks, and then you have to move. Right. It can be ten feet, and you it's moved. Or, well, it's. Uh, I believe it has to be. Um, what is it? It has to be at least a mile or so. For dispersed camping. In the state park, all you have to do is move sites, actually. Yeah. <laughs> as long as that site's open for the week. But it, it's... When you pull up the form, or when you get the form from DNR, it actually has all the rules, all the regulations on it, um, as far as um, what they mean by setting up camp, 
um, what they consider a camp, um, the rules for parking. You can't park more than 50 feet off the trail. Um, that's probably this what, is what's got you hot right now. Yes, this is what. Is. So let's let's dive headfirst into this part that's got you pretty hot because <laughs> you're a dispersed camper. You go usually go out on a motorcycle, right? I, I my family has um, spent many years up in the St. Helen Ross Common area. Correct. Um, but that's where I've I basically grew up riding the trails up there. Right, and. I have had several of the camping areas that we stayed at shut down because of people pulling campers and RVs in there and also because of people on four-wheelers and bikes and stuff tearing stuff up. Um, But isn't dispersed camping camping open for everyone? It is open for everyone. But you should not be taking a camper into an area where you're tearing up the ground. If you're t- taking a camper in and you're leaving tracks, leaving ruts in the ground, it's too soft. Right. If you're taking a camper in and it's scraping up, if you're scraping down the sides with trees, it's too tight. You don't need to be going in there. there. If, if you need running, four-wheel drive to get in. That was my next point. Or if you're running over saplings, you shouldn't be in there. These are all reasons I've seen area shut down. Five, ten plus acre size areas that are now blocked off by three foot tall piles of logs that DNR put down and have signs up that it's for area reclamation. They're trying to reclaim that area and let it get back to normal and let it and heal, if you will. Right. (laughs) And this is within a hundred yards. And these, these are two spots within 100 yards. You were mentioning the ORV, the ORV license. Right, the RV uh, stickers and trail permits. And, um, well, this will go along with the, well, those fees actually doubled a couple years ago. Why is that? From $16 to about $32 or $35. Um, part of that would be due to... The fact they didn't increase for quite a few years, but mm-hmm. part of it is due to damage that's being done in the woods, damage that's being done to trails, trails to lead in paths, because people are basically going down right, a path doing that, to being done to the forest that DNR is having to go out and fix. That there's cost involved. There's time. There's money. That um, this is all information that is available from DNR Um, and like the state park stickers, Mm -hmm. the Metro park passes, those fees, parts of those all go towards trail reclamation, forest reclamation, things like that. And it, it does get me very upset when I'm out in the woods. I'm the type of person I stay on the trail. I hate seeing tracks off of the trail. It infuriates me. I hate seeing piles of trash on the trail, off the sides of trails, off the sides of RV routes, where people have gone and taken. <laughs> now, do you think these are people these, coming up from you know down south or you know from other places, or are these locals just dumping? I think it. I think a lot of it's probably locals. Yeah, that I. That's you know that. The, it, the it, damage you see from it campers everything. are. It, it's yeah. not just it's not just the campers. It's it's so many people that just feel that oh, it, I'm not a problem. It, it, nobody's going to notice this. Yeah. That's that's the thing. If you go into these trails, you come out like you were never there. That's the idea. Other that, than the flat spot where your tent was, you should or leave. the string you couldn't get out of the tree because it was too high. Where you tied your bear the old bear thing off to get your uh, keep your food up there. Well, there, there should be zero sign that you were in right. the, in those woods after there should be no, a week. Right. There should be no footprint left there when I go in. Other than a footprint. <laughs> right. There's The only tracks I leave are literally tracks. The only thing you can see are the tire tracks from my truck in the sand where I drove up in, into my campsite. Well, you're, then, you're driving and then you're hiking in, correct? Right. Or are you driving right to your campsite off of the trail? I drive right from the trail right to my campsite, and I'm parking 
10 feet off of the trail. And then my truck sits there for the weekend. And But and you're then, not tearing anything up when you do so? Nope. So these people I'm are, basically so going they're in, in barely an idle. So where you go in and you stop, people are going in further with four-wheel drive trucks and campers? Yes. Uh, the area I'm at, I've actually seen a truck with 44-inch tires, mud tires, oh, get Jesus. stuck. Because it's really soft in there. Because it's all sand. It's a foot plus of sand. Yeah. That's terrible. Or you so, get some guy that drives off into the woods in his work truck. Tom. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine what idiot would do that. <laughs> so, qu- quick side story. Tom, but I mean, Tom, it's, t- I'm not against people taking trailers into the woods. I'm not... Not against that. Right. You need to use some sense. Right. If if the trail's soft, don't do it. Check it, before you go tear it into it, too. Right. You if know. It's, there are a lot of forest roads. There's a lot of um, RV routes that are very hard packed, that are almost city street hard. Right. That you can take your camper down, and there's... Or your work truck. Yeah. So I was going to say, quick story for Tom. He was, uh, over the winter, he delivers for, uh, can I say who you deliver for? I don't care. He's a pizza kit driver for for little for Blue Line Food. So his GPS took him, ended up dumping him into a groomed uh, snowmobile trail and didn't realize it until the groomers were coming right at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew something was wrong before they were coming at me. Oh, okay. But... Uh, yeah, they I'm, pushed him off the road. He got stuck. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, though, once I was on there, there was I couldn't stop because if I had stopped, I was going to be stuck. Right. And, and I couldn't turn around. There wasn't room. I couldn't back up because again, I was afraid. So all I could do was just keep plowing forward. Right. And then the groomers were coming at me, and there were not there was not room for three vehicles on that road and i got stuck in the embankment because of it so and they hit your truck too didn't they our, our mirrors clipped each other <laughs> it was that was a crazy story he actually had a <laughs> tow truck had to come find him in the woods but yes it backed up all the way from the main road to pull me out <laughs> and then stayed hooked to you on the way out didn't he uh no he 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 made sure i followed him so that i i didn't get stuck again gotcha so well, that's just a little funny side story. Everybody in town knew who he was before the end of the night. You're the bar, the, the hotel, the, uh, the the coffee shop in the morning. You're the guy. You're the guy. <laughs> You're the guy. But that's that's obviously that's an honest GPS mistake. And you know when it's the dead of winter and there's that much snow, you can't tell the difference between a groomed snowmobile or a groomed county road or a groomed snowmobile trail. trail. Yeah, there's well, and and that's the thing. One of the well, the trail where I actually got stuck is a paved highway. During the normal time of the year, right? Uh, but at this, at during the winter time, it was groomed for. Oh yeah, I always love those um, unmaintained seasonal road uh, signs. <laughs> he, he didn't see him. No, no. GPS said turn here. So, right. but anyway, so your your issue with that is is people coming in. Doesn't matter if it's locals, people out of state, people coming in, going deep into the trails for dispersed camping, tearing tearing stuff up. Tearing it up on the way in, tearing it up on the way out, and then leaving their garbage behind. Right. It's the disrespect. It's the the neglect. It's the I, way I was brought up, the way I was raised. I, I came up through scouts. I was brought up, whatever you bring in, you take out. Yep. I mean, I'm the type of person that's like... You've seen it. I'm out there picking up everyone else's trash. Yep. And it's been that way, though, I mean, since and they first started opening state parks. Because um, when they would go out to Grand Canyon or something like that, and and uh, that's been a long bane of uh, people leaving their trash. They called them the tin canners. They le- left their trash behind. They didn't clean up. Tom with them. old school nicknames for <laughs> hey, I only read traveling the book. folk out west. I only read the book. <laughs> I, I mean, it's this is things that people should be doing that I don't understand why they aren't. But it's the same people we've got right now who just uh, they take their gloves off, they take their mask off, and they throw it on the ground. They can't even be bothered to find. Oh, during Rona, yeah. Oh, god, the garbage from Rona right now is is disgraceful. You walk through any any shopping lot, parking lot, there's gloves and yeah. They can't even be bothered to find a trash can on their your damn car until you get home. That yeah, are everywhere in the parking. Yes, lot. yes, and and ending up also in, in my yard and in front of my house and, and you know because they've blown in from who knows where. And people just 
they think this stuff is just going to disappear once they've thrown it on the ground. My goal when I go camping is, like you're saying, you're not going to see where I was after a couple days. I'll dig my fire pit. I'll dig a chunk of grass out of the ground, flip it over. When I leave, I take and put it back in the hole. With some new nutrients. (laughs) I mean... So basically, you don't even see where my fire pit was. Nice. Unless you're going in there and looking for it. You're not going to see where my tent was after a couple Eagle of days. Scout. Eagle Scout, guys. Because I just don't <laughs> like leaving that, and that's stuff w- torn up. One of the things on the show we're going to want to talk about all the time is, you know, make sure you do your part as a camper to keep what we enjoy as a privilege not a, it's a privilege, not a right. Exactly, and that's the thing. The state can take all that stuff away from us if they want. The more the stuff's getting torn up, the more trash that's getting left out there, the more they're going to close down, the more they're going to take away. It's, they're going to start making you pay if they got to come in and clean up your shit. That's why the fees are going up. Exactly. It's our responsibility to take care of the land, to maintain the land. If we don't do that, we're going to lose it. Exactly. And it, that was exactly why they were going to go and do the ban of alcohol on the rivers, because people were destroying the rivers, getting injured, doing things that was just that plain, well, simple, not being responsible. Yeah, that that's just it. When when I was with the boys and we'd go camping and, and one of the things that just discouraged me from wanting to go out is just the tubers and the canoers and the ki- and they would tie their tubes together and and get drunk. They're just drunken idiots floating down the river. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not going to lie. That has destroyed the, the beauty of going canoeing and camping. You know, yes. When you're camping is, is the weekenders that are just there to get obliterated on the river. Yes. and you That's know, their goal is to get drunk on the river. Yes. And as much fun as that was in my youth, I, I look back on it as, you know, good times. But in hindsight, with obviously with age, you... You see that, okay, this should have been, we could have done this more responsible. We could have broken up the groups a little bit because you know, there are other people on the river. We're going to get off on a tangent on that, and we kind of already did. Uh, we did that last year uh, when they first talked about that. But now with the show, it gives us a little bit more of a platform. Um, the um, National Forest Park Services are no longer talking about that anymore. The community got together with the people and the liveries and, you know, none of us talked about it, that people are, are starting to take responsibility for it more now than before. So that's that's a great thing to hear. Um, the canoe liveries are obviously the ones responsible for putting these people out there. So they've got to limit the size of the groups that go out together. You know, they got to spread them out more, you know. But ultimately, you shouldn't be getting together with 60 people or 60 friends or 40 friends and going, I mean, ultimately, yes, but no. Ultimately, in the end, it's the people's responsibility that are on the river. It's not the livery's responsibility. They're the ones putting them in the water. It should be their responsibility. It's well, in their stuff with their name on it. They should be responsible. I'm uh, sorry. I, no, you, you, you're partly right, though, and so is he. See, the problem is... The liveries are putting people out on public property, okay? Once it's public property, that's the individual's responsibility. Oh, absolutely. That's, you know. But, uh, that, but it's, that's, it's that's like me going out in my work truck and acting a fool or driving inappropriately, you know, that's even though I'm on that's public your property. That's fault. Well, if yeah, you exactly. Do, if you're yeah, doing something if, stupid same in a work no, truck, no, it's still your, your fault. Truck, you're still liable. If you're in your work truck, you're on private property. That's the company's property. No, I mean just out on the – well, okay, maybe a bad analogy. That's a whole <laughs> – but, but it's, the principle, the idea of it is still the same because you're, you're out in a, in a Hefner or you know one of these places up north. Um, shout out to our people at uh, Riverview. Hope you guys are doing well after the floods. You guys are recovering. Did you guys see that? Riverview was eight feet – almost nine feet underwater. I think I showed no, you. That you I didn't. didn't. Yeah, uh, one of our one of the campgrounds that we spoke to during season one, and one of my favorite canoe camping campgrounds. The place where I camped is destroyed. the The, the water came in eight feet over the wow. over the banks. I'm not sure if that was just from flooding or another broke. There was that was different from the Midland County area stuff that flooded. This was other stuff that flooded. I'm not sure how that was all tied together, but it was yeah, it was eight feet of flooding. Um, 
it took three or four days for the water to recede. And when it did, it there's trees drop. I'm obviously dragged in all the debris, picked everything up off the riverbeds and brought it. So hopefully the river will be a lot cleaner, but the property cleanup is going to be a nightmare. Oh, God, I, I don't know how many people lost their homes along the river. You know, those people that were, you know, right off the, you know, they're three, four feet off the riverbed, you know, and their houses were up there. Those were all flooded, too. They had to be. I mean, it wasn't just Riverview on the, all the campgrounds through there, not just Riverview. But anyway, off on a tangent. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's this, it's the same principle. Pick up your stuff. Don't leave your beer cans at your campsite. Don't leave them on the river. And this doesn't go just for dispersed camping, for canoeing. This goes for wherever you're camping, state campground, state yep. park. Be respectable of everybody else. Right. right. If you're out at... Pick up after your dogs. <laughs> if you're on a, at a, Jesus. On a picnic, whatever. Exactly. I mean, it's it, it all ties together, people. I mean, we can only do this together. You know, that's the only way this is going to work. So you know, we're just helping to spread the word. Obviously, some of you are new to camping. You know, the generation gaps here are getting wider and wider. You're getting people raised differently so that than we were, which is, you know, unfortunate. Right. But I they mean, don't have the same respects that Tom did, that I do, that you do. You and know? I mean, and this... And this goes into... We're 50s, 40s, and 30s right here, so we're talking this, three different this generations. This goes into hunting, fishing, everything that Michigan is known for. Most hunters were raised that way. That's the one good thing. You don't see... you Don't. But there, don't get me wrong, there's still the bad apples. There's still the idiot that shows up and plays the brown, it's down game, and does nothing but get drunk the entire weekend. Never shoots a deer. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so there, there's still all of that that's, that's out there. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about the dispersed camping before we wrap things up? Um, no, not really. I mean, basically, if, you're, if you need any specific information or have any questions that you need answered, uh, I would just contact the DNR office. Michigan.gov backslash DNR. Yep, or just give them a call if you need a specific answer. They'll be... I know they'll be glad to answer that for you. Absolutely. Tom, any more uh, comments about uh, the trails or any of that good stuff? Mm, no. Anything you thought about from the Dutch oven cooking that we didn't cover? <laughs> no, I think we covered that one pretty well. <laughs> we did. Well, it was gonna be a, we knew it was going to be a quick, short show here. We've got uh, a lot of stuff still to do. Uh, I, I mean, the weather's been gorgeous. Honestly, I've every weekend since I've come back from the over-the-road stuff that I was doing um, during the Rona, I've spent in the yard. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, because that's while while the campgrounds were shut down, because usually I'm camping every weekend so that I wasn't able to. Now my property's benefiting from that. So our place looks immaculate. But now it's camping season. You know, um, I, I, I got yard work to do today. But while you're here, I'm thinking, let's shoot some more videos and pack some bearings and do some of this and some of that. But I'm going to work on getting the uh, the Hensley Arrow video released. So. Um, Tom, Andy, thanks for coming. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Hensley Arrow, Dan Cheney at Lasco Ford, uh, Air Ups. Look for the Air Ups arch. You'll see us when we're out camping. We're going to be, uh, I think we're heading up somewhere near West Branch, Warblers Campground, something we just found out about. We're going to go and check that out. It's a private campground with some good amenities, really good prices, uh, water and, and, and power hookups. And we're uh, just, I think, well, my phone's on airplane mode, so I don't know if they called back, but I'll check. And uh, we're going to try and head up there and check out that place um, either really soon or something. I just realized, I thought she said North Branch, not West, West Branch. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference between heading, you know, an hour away, an hour and a half away, and then two hours away. So, yes. hmm. yeah, well, West, <laughs> West Branch is more than two. Yeah, yeah, yeah on, a, at, on a Friday afternoon. Three. It's three to four. Yeah. Well, four in a truck. <laughs> four in a truck, yeah. And with, well, with the Hensley, I can I can cook a little two extra. With, two with him, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, as I was saying, so, yeah, um, you know, all of our sponsors, obviously, uh, the Scented Bean, Coffee Express Co., who am I forget? Buzz Tees, the official easy, yep. apply. If you guys want to get some uh, cool Camp Talk Live gear, go to camptalklivegear.com. And uh, order all your hoodies and beanies and stuff for there. Uh, Pat Donahue from our from the, the the last really live show we did here about the Hensley, he bought himself a beautiful burgundy Camp Talk Live hoodie. It looks really nice. So I got to snatch that picture. I think it's it might be on our page or it's in the community aspect where people post. I'm thinking I might have to get a T-shirt that color. It's yeah, it's really cool. Just for wearing. Well, around. you originally you start off as just show staff, so you got a different shirt than. Right. 
But well, we uh, just need some T-shirts just for wearing around at the site. Yeah, we definitely should order us some Camp Talk Live T-shirts. I'll I'll talk to uh, I'll talk to my buddy over at uh, Buzz Tees about that. But so, like I said. Uh, Hensley Arrow, thank you. Uh, appreciate your patience with the delay of last month. We did not get out. Uh, I don't think we get, we got anything out. There was just no time between the work and the quarantine. Um, we got locked down a little bit more after because when we first started this, we did the we did the Hensley install and video, right. and then it was like we didn't see each other for a while. So I haven't seen Tom in three months. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, we got grounded pretty well. Yeah, we did, but uh, that's been lifted. I mean. Those of us that know that you know we've been working and, and doing what we do on a normal basis, so that's why we're not sitting here in face masks because we know we, what each other's been doing and nobody's been sick. So hopefully it's like the flu. Summertime's here. It's it's done, and hopefully it goes away. Obviously, you know it's something serious. Um, so uh, thanks again to all of our sponsors. I'll recap them one more time: Hensley Harrow, Dan Cheney over at Lasco Ford, Buzz Tees, Air Ups, The Scented Bean, and Coffee Express Co. Um, we're still waiting to hear from our buddy over at Speedy Blaze. I don't know where he's at. Where are you at, bud? Hey, <laughs> thanks to all our viewers. Yep, thanks for watching. Make sure you go and check us out on Google Podcasts. We just posted up the Western Road Trip inter uh, interview with uh, Jim Walter um, from the Suburban Showplace that we did back in February. Uh, we were going to release that earlier, but with the Rona, it just didn't the subject matter didn't really seem to fit. So, I mean, if you want to start planning for next year, it was uh, we, I had to release the the audio for that. So. Um, Unfortunately, the video was corrupted. <laughs> was out of all the videos we did that day, that was the only one that, that uh, I don't know, we only had 30 minutes sure. of it and the camera shut off. So everybody uh, take care and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.